tonight we have here with us uh, senior librarian uh, Makiswari. She will share with us on some of the earliest printed map in the National Library's rare map uh, collection. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Makiswari. Most of the um, <clears throat> maps we have are mainly uh, on Southeast Asia and Asia itself, with a few showing, um, <clears throat> in fact, quite a number will show um, Singapore and um, Malaysia, but not always in the recognizable names that we know Singapore and Malaysia as. All right? And um, most of these maps date uh, pre-1945. Uh, those in the rare collection, those after 1945 will be uh, kept in the closed text collections, which are at level 11 of the Lee Kong Chien Reference Library. Okay, um, what's interesting about these um, maps are the fact that um, they're all printed maps. Okay, so for now, we don't have any manuscripts uh, copies. And uh, they actually show the European mapping of Southeast Asia itself. Okay, and also it shows the early cartography of the Southeast Asian region. And as I said earlier, we do have early references to Singapore and the Malay Peninsula. And Singapore, you will find interestingly, although it's not mapped out as an island in those days, it will be just a word, or sometimes it could be part of a town on the uh, Johor, or sometimes it's depicted as a waterway, a street. Okay. Okay. Before I move on, I just wanted to show you some of the um, names that uh, these early maps depicted Singapore as. You can see uh, it's as CD. Simkapula, which is a cape. You have the recognizable Singapura. <coughs> you have the very interesting name called Chinkatola. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, and you have the other name, which is Sainkapur, but you can see that it's added with Jatana. And the other name that it's not recognizable is the Bargin Gapura. Okay, I'll explain later what these names mean. And of course, if you look at early maps of uh, Southeast Asia in the collection, you will find that Southeast Asia is not known as Southeast Asia, which is a name that came up much later um, during the World War II. Although we do have a travel account by Malcolm, which says travels to Southeastern Asia, which is one of the earliest references then. But you will find that the maps most of the time mentions this region as India Orientalist or East Indies. East Indies and Netherlands Indies was also interchangeably used for Indonesia. And you also have the region being identified as further India. Why is that so? Because when, when they were traveling here, when the Europeans were traveling here, they first went to India. They found the sailing routes to India. Then from India, they came down east. So Southeast Asia was always beyond India or further India or east of Indies. While for the Chinese, as you know, Southeast Asia was known as Nanyang or the South Seas because from China, Southeast Asia is towards the south, right? I'm going to talk about, before I go on to the maps, I'm going to talk a bit about the early references to Singapore in um, written uh, texts. And one of the earliest references we have is by this uh, Chinese trader called Wang Dayuan. Okay, pardon my. Um, pronunciation okay he he wrote this uh, he actually made two trips to to Southeast Asia and he wrote this uh, book called Dao Dao Ye Shi Lui right okay it's uh, literally translates as descriptions of the barbarians of the Isles I don't I don't think he meant actual barbarians it could just mean that he he he, he referred to the natives as the barbarians of the uh, Isles he came around 1330s. When he finally compiled his work, it was in the mid-14th century, around 1349. What's interesting about his uh, work is that he refers to three places which relates to um, early Singapore. One is the fact that Tan Masi, which was an early name, Tamasik or Tumasik, an early local name that was used for uh, Singapore within the region, and Long Yaman. Long Yaman is... Uh, was called Lot's Wife by the British, and by the Malays, the locals, it was called uh, Batu Balaya. It was actually the two rock outcrops 
that was at the mouth of the Keppel Harbour, but it was blown up by, um, by John Turnbull Thompson in August 1848. That was after Raffles, uh, because uh, Thompson wanted to widen the mouth of the Singapore River so that the British ships could pass through. So he actually um, blew it up, just like the Singapore stone was blown up. But the third place that he referred to was the, what he called the Banzu, or in, it's a Chinese transliteration of Panchur, which is a Malay word for spring of water. So it seems there was actually a fresh water spring in the Fort Canning Hill, which was used as an ancient place uh, for bathing by the princesses. Okay, so these are the three places he uh, refers to, which, is, uh, which are early references to um, Singapore. But of course, when he mentions Danmasi, he doesn't really s mention the island. He mentions actually the surrounding area near the island. Okay, and I've actually uh, shown you a map of, um, this is a map from the Mills collection. Um, it's called Lot's Wife and the Singapore Strait. It's actually a manuscript map, but we only have a photocopy. This is by, photocopied by J.V. Mills in the 1930s from uh, British Museum, the library's collection, and as well as other institutions overseas. And this map will show you that that's the mouth of the river, and then you see the outcrop there, that's called Lot's Wife. Actually, there were two outcrops, and this is showing only one. Okay. All right. Now, three other early references to Singapore in uh, written text before we move on. I just want to mention this uh, Nagara Kirtagama, which is a Javanese um, epic poem. It was composed by the royal poet called uh, Prapancha. Okay, it actually names Tumasik as a dependency under the Majapahit uh, kingdom. This is generally believed to be referring to the Singapore island. Another one is the what we famously know as Sejarah Melayu or Malay Annals, Sulalat Al Salatin. Okay, and this one. Um, doesn't really refer to the Masik, but it, it tells the story of this Sumatran prince coming, you know, traveling to the island, finding a lion there, and then naming the island Singapore and establishing a, a settlement. And how the Malay Annals goes on to add that how it became a flourishing trading, trading port. Okay? And finally, I want to mention this Arab um, scholar's uh, text called uh, Hawiyat. It's actually a poem. Uh, by Ibn Majid, Ahmad Ibn, bin, uh, Ahmad Ibn Majid. Okay, he's actually what he called a master Arab navigator. He was very famous because he wrote a lot of uh, sailing directions for voyages around the Malayan coast. And, um, and in, in the sailing directions, he actually mentions Singapore. Okay, although the sailing directions are not very detailed, but he mentions that from Malacca, you go down this way towards Singapore. So there's also one early reference. Okay, we'll go on to some early maps showing um, Singapore of the region of Singapore. This is um, Wu Pei Chi, uh, compiled by uh, Mao Yuan Yi Jie. Um, the library's copy is of course a uh, 1800s um, copy, um, but it was first compiled in uh, early um, 17th um, century. The Wu Pei Chu is actually uh, what you call um, a Chinese military uh, tactics book. It's considered a Chinese military encyclopedia. It's one of the most comprehensive ones. And um, within this uh, Wu Pei Chu, in chapter two, 240, you actually have charts of Admiral Cheng He's travels to the Southeast Asia region. Now, Admiral Cheng He made about seven voyages overseas. And these were later charted, the, the sailing routes that he took were actually charted, and these routes were made into maps. Uh, unlike um, English or European maps, you can see Chinese maps are very different. And if I'm not mistaken, this is, um, this is I have a copy on display. I have this copy on display so you can look at it. This is the Long Yaman. So it actually shows how they are traveling from the Sunda Strait down to Malacca down. Okay, Malacca will be here, Sunda Strait, and then Long Yaman here, which is referring to the two outcrops at the Keppel Harbor. It's famously known as the Maokun map because Maokun was actually the uh, Mao Yuanji's uh, grandfather. 
and the map was found in Mao, his grandfather's library. Another map that's in the collection will be um, Theodore Debris, who, uh, who's actually a Flemish uh, cartographer. And um, this is actually not a map, sorry. This is actually what he call a, a schematic sketch. Okay? Now, why did he do this? Because he was trying, it's actually not a map title. Uh, the Contrafactor Desk much is actually not a title, it's actually a description you know, of what happened. It says, um, it's a chart uh, showing the skirmish between the Dutch, Hollanders, and the Portuguese along the jo Johor River. The Johor River is identified as Rio Balusabar. Okay. He, he drew this map because in um, October 1603, the, the Dutch and the Portuguese were fighting over the control of the Singapore Straits. And this map actually shows a lot of early names of, of Singapore. It's also one of the earliest close-up views of the coastline of Singapore, the southeastern coastline of um, Singapore. Now, the reason why the uh, British, I mean, sorry, the Dutch and the Portuguese were fighting is because in February 1603, the Dutch went and uh, attacked the Portuguese uh, ship called Santa Catarina and they took away its cargo, its very expensive cargo, and they sold it in Amsterdam. And, I mean, and the Portuguese were very angry. So what they did, and because the Dutch were helped by the Johor Sultanate, the Dutch, uh, the Portuguese decided that they will go and blockade the Johor River to prevent the Johor ships from coming out and also to protect their own ships because their own ships were coming from Macau down to Malacca to trade because the Portuguese were controlling uh, Macau, Malacca and Goa at the time. So they wanted to protect their own trading ships. Um, when the Dutch heard of this uh, blockade, there were three Dutch ships around the region, so they decided to go and attack the um, Portuguese uh, fleets, and the Dutch succeeded in chasing them away. So after that, the Dutch and the Johor Sultan became friends, more friends than before. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a close-up. Um, do you see? Do you see? Uh, this uh, is the Strait of Singapore. This is uh, it says Cast Unbekan, it means coast unknown, because before the British came to Singapore in 1819. Singapore's coastlines were not charted at all. Okay, so if you look at maps, most of the detailed maps of Singapore came after the 1819. And you can see Singapore here and the Karimon Islands. Okay, I wanted to show you this because um, do you see this is the river? This is the river, Johor River. And you can see the Johor Sultan ships are waiting. And this is the eastern side of Singapore. And these are the ships of uh, Portuguese, the smaller ones, and the three bigger ships of the, um, of the uh, Dutch. Okay, the Johor River is uh, here. And the Dutch ships and the Portuguese ships and the Johor Sultan ships are waiting. Okay, an interesting feature I want to point out is, do you notice that the Singapore, this, this, this part of Singapore seems to be joined with the mainland? So probably Theodore de Brie didn't know that it was actually a separate island. You can see this, yeah. And the ships are also marked to identify them. Pedra Blanca is uh, it's right at the top here. Can't, I, I think it's cut off right at the top here. Pedra Blanca, uh, Pedra Blanca was actually more often identified on maps than Singapore itself because it was a navigational landmark. So if you find most of the maps will have those navigational landmarks which the sailors and the mariners were interested in. But of course, in, in different ways of spelling and pronunciation. Okay, the final map to show Singapore. Manuel Godinho de Iradia. Okay, Iradia is um, a very interesting guy because he's what you call one of the early Eurasians. Uh, his father is uh, a Portuguese captain and his mother was a, a local uh, Bugis uh, princess. She eloped with him. And, uh, but thankfully, he married her, or else the father would have attacked him. And, and they had uh, four children, and he's the youngest. Okay? And um, he seems he was educated in Malacca. He was also educated in uh, Portugal. Uh, 
um, and so he was also hired as a as a cartographer by um, by by Portugal, and his contribution is that he actually drafted a uh, he drew a lot of maps on on the region, and unlike Theodore de Brie that we saw earlier, Iredia had more intimate knowledge of the region, so his maps were more accurate. So he actually drew a lot of reports. Uh, he, he wrote a lot of reports and drew a lot of maps on Malacca and Singapore. And this map on Singapore was actually first drawn in 1604 when he was accompanying the Portuguese to, to Johor. And, uh, but we don't have the original manuscripts. The original manuscript is actually with the Royal Library of uh, Belgium. Um, we have what he called the 1882 publication done by um, then by uh, Jensen, who actually ha had a French translation together with the Portuguese uh, text. And you can see that um, Singapore is here. Do you see Singapore? Yes, Singapore is, um, is down here. And you can see Viontana. Viontana was uh, a European or a Portuguese corruption of the word Ujongtana. Ujongtana was used by the locals. It's actually a Malay word to say land's end. Sometimes you will find some of the maps will also look at Singapore and depict Singapore as Pulau Ujong, uh, Pulau Tana, that means island at the end, or Ujong Tana, at land's end, because Singapore was right at the end of the Malay Peninsula. So that's the reference they got. Oh, there's something right at the end of the Malay Peninsula. Okay. I have a close up. And, um, this map is uh, good because, as, as I said, Iredia is, um, was familiar with the region. All right? And he knew that there was an island here, Singapore. And he also mentioned or depicts some of the early names that we already know of Singapore. Like you have um, Tanjong Ru, Sungai Bodo is actually Sungai Bodo, Sungai Budok, sorry. <laughs> and do you see Tanamera? Yes, Tanamera is the more familiar. And you have uh, Tanjong Rusa. Now, Tanjong Rusa is not used um, very, uh, very much. Uh, this is one of the only maps I find it in. Tanjong Rusa, it seems, is actually the early name for Changi Point. Yeah. But if you look at uh, a map that's done after 1819, Captain Franklin, who surveyed Singapore, will call Changi Point Franklin Point. You know, so I guess you can take the liberty until it's named as Changi Point. And um, besides that, do you see this Shabandria? Do you see Shabandria here? Okay, sorry, I have to do it two times. Okay, Shabandria actually is another uh, corru uh, Portuguese corruption of the word Shabanda. So actually there was a Shabanda's office there, which means it was a port master's office. I mean, if this was done in 1600s and there was a port master's office, then there must have been active trade happening along the Singapore Channel for them to have a port master, you know, to regulate the trade. So this is one of the evidences to show that Singapore's waterways were actually quite active because they were a gateway between the Indian Ocean and the South, South China Sea. As the China, China trade was quite important then. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, the map is oriented. This is uh, Johor here, so the north is, I'm sorry, I forgot about the orientation. The current orientation of maps is north at the top, but in those days, they did take liberties, as I will show you another map by Lin Shoten. North can be depicted as the bottom and north south is at the top. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the orientation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you can, you ha I don't want to tilt it upside down because then the Singapore will be upside down. Okay. Yes. It could be, but I'm not sure about that. I haven't really looked into that. But I noticed that uh, most of the maps will have north. Most of the European maps will have north at the top. But there are some maps. I'll show you Lin Shoten's and Gastaldi's map, which actually uh, changes that. Yes, it's inverted. But I think in later part, I think 18th century onwards, there must have been some decisions to standardize the orientation so that it's easier to read. Oh, I forgot to mention also Blakan Mati is also there. 
I'm not sure whether it's visible. Uh, it's here, right at the top. Blakang Mati is, of course, Pulau Blakang Mati, Sentosa now. It's right at the top here. Yeah. I can't blow up the maps any bigger. <laughs> Sometimes there's a limitations on this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to move on to um, uh, to European maps in in the collection. Um, and uh, before I, I I show you some of the maps, I wanted to talk about uh, Claudius Ptolemy. You all know about him, right? Um, <coughs> Ptolemy um, is considered uh, the father of modern uh, geography, but there were geographers uh, before him. But why his geography or geography manual is um, important is because, unlike the earlier geographers before him, he actually used a scientific method to present his data. Okay, so in his geography, you will actually find latitude and longitudes for over 8,000 places. Of course, this was done in the second century and Ptolemy was in charge of the library of Alexandrina, Alexandria. And um, what happened was, he actually used the works of the other geographers. He also spoke to the travelers who were passing through at the time where he was in Greece. And, um, um, he, spoke, and he also used the books in the library itself. Okay? So his work may not be considered totally uh, original because he did base his work on earlier geographers, but it's original in the sense that he actually gave the coordinates for 8,000 over places. All right? And these coordinates were, and he also left very rigorous instructions for map making. It seems he did not create any maps, but he left instructions for map making, and these instructions were later used by the Europeans to draw their uh, maps. And um, the first printed edition, of course, with maps came out in uh, 1477. The library has the second printed uh, edition of, of, of the Southeast Asian region. Okay, so this is the um, earliest um, map that we have in the collection, which you can, uh, we can take a look at the physical copy um, down there. And um, interestingly, you can see that, uh, do you see, uh, one of the errors perpetuated by Ptolemy is the fact that, where is it? Oh, do you see this? It's as if it's the Southern Ocean part is closed. So Europeans for a long time thought that you cannot sail through this way to the other part of the world. You have to make one big round the other way. Do you see this part here? Yeah, so one of the errors perpetuated by Ptolemy was that this, this is a landmass here closing off entry to ships. And this was perpetuated for hundreds of, um, of years. Okay, although um, Ptolemy wrote his um, manual in the second century, it was actually lost. By the time the Roman Empire declined, it was actually um, lost. What happened was the Islamic scholars in Arab discovered it in the, about ninth century, and then they translated it into Arab, Arabic. sorry, and Subsequently, the European scholars discovered it about 11th century or 12th century, and they translated it into Latin. That's when the European cartographers became very excited and started using Ptolemy's instructions for map, makings, map making. And you have actually manuscript maps. Before 1470s, you have manuscript maps that were created, but the first printed map was in 1477. And this is the second printed edition. And you can see Malaya, I'll show you, but it's known as, or um, Malay Peninsula is known as Oreo Chersonesis, which means golden Chersonis. You know why? Because it seems we had a lot of gold here, okay? And um, uh, in the ancient world, it was understood even during Ptolemy's time that there was actually a lot of gold in this area. This is the uh, region that refers to Southeast Asia and the Malay Peninsula, all joined up. This is the area. You see Oreo Chersonis here, Golden Chersonis. It's a term that's used by travelers in the um, 19th century as well. If you look at some of the early works on travels here, we'll see Golden Chersonis. And do you see here Sabana, right at the tip? Right, I'm not sure whether you can see this. Right at the tip is what you call uh, Sabana. 
So when Ptolemy identified um, some of the places here, he actually identified what they call emporiums or port cities. Because at that time, they were, they were only interested in the port cities and the emporiums. So Sabana is, is a very famous port city or emporium at the time. Some scholars say, does it refer to Singapore? Some say it may not. So we are not very sure about this. Moving on, it, this is 1535. Okay, you know um, Malacca was captured by the um, Portuguese in 1511. By 1498, um, the Portuguese had already found a route to India. So they had managed to go to India. And why they were so interested in coming to Asia was of course because of the spices. The spices were getting very expensive and uh, it was very, very difficult to get hold of the spices. So they decided to find a route to India. Asia and the Spice Islands. So one of the places they went to first was India, 1498. By 1511, they had reached Malacca, and they had captured Malacca and and were in and they had built a fort there and were in control. But in 1535, you still see that the maps being drawn by the um, by the cartographers, the European cartographers, still followed the Ptolemy's influence. This is because although they tried to incorporate the new discoveries made by the European, Europeans, they still could not move away from the Ptolemaic tradition. So although uh, you don't have the um, hexagon shape, you still have that Malay Peninsula is joined together with, um, with, with the rest of the Southeast Asia, and you have Sumatra here. But in the earlier map, did you notice Sumatra seems to be together? Do you see Sumatra is actually all joined together? So here you have a separate one. But interesting, uh, interestingly, you can see that, oops, sorry, sorry. You, s you notice that it juts out from the equator. The Malay Peninsula is actually jutting out below the equator. So some of the early maps will, will show the Malay Peninsula and Southeast Asia as jutting out. And do you see Traporobrana here? This is Taprobana. This is actually Sumatra. Taprobana was an early Ptolemy name that was used. Taprobana was an early Ptolemy name that was used for uh, Sri Lanka, Ceylon. You will find it actually on a lot of maps that depicts Sri Lanka as um, Taprobana. But in some maps, it's also confused by cartographers, and Sumatra is depicted as um, Taprobana. And the one that I wanted to mention is actually this word, Barging Kapura. Bargim Kapura is uh, noted by scholars as referring to Singapore. They identify that Singapore was an important gateway to China. So Gapura is an old Sanskrit word to mean Gopura, gateway. And Bar, they claim it's uh, Arabic for land or coast. And Gin, or they translate as Shin, is China. So one of the early identifications of Singapore is that it was a gateway to the China trade. And uh, you can see, do you see Malakwa here? Most of the maps, um, when they depict Malay Peninsula, will show only Malacca, because Malacca was the importing, important trading port. And of course, you have this uh, Lamai Rigmi with a king on a throne. That was uh, their way of thinking that there was actually a kingdom there known as Lamai, somewhere near Thailand. Okay, so I'm going moving on. Ah, the next map, Rodricus, by Francisco um, Rodricus. He was actually a contemporary of um, Albuquerque, who captured uh, Malacca in uh, 1511, and um, he he came here around uh, 15, 1512 or so. He was accompanying the Portuguese on their way to the um, to the Moluccas Islands because they were trying to find a route to the Moluccas Islands, the Spice Islands, where the spices were. And as he was, um, he actually made use of, it seems, local charts that are no longer available. And he also had contact with local pilots. I mean the uh, local boogies, sailors, or, or whoever was here locally. And from them, he drew the knowledge of the region. Okay, so you have almost uh, discernible. This is in 1512, around there. It was, the book was published in 1515. 
and you have a most discernible um, Malay Peninsula here and with the name Samgapura at the end. Okay, I've turned the map around a bit. The map, the original map is this way. There's actually a book, it's on display. And do you see the map? Do you see this, Samgapura? Yeah, so this is almost similar, but not really um, Singapore yet. But you notice one unique thing, because the locals actually uh, called the island Tamasic. You know, it was known to be Tamasic, but none of the um, European printed maps have the word Tamasic anywhere in them. Even Rodriguez, who was actually, you know, looking at local charts, who was um, um, in contact with the local pilots, he did not put it down as, as Tamasic, which is quite um, interesting. Another map by um, Gastaldi. <coughs> Okay, I must mention before I move on that this map is oriented with the north at the bottom and the south is at the top. Do you see? Okay, yes. The, one of the ways is of course to recognize where is Sumatra. This is Taprobana here. Sumatra is known as Taprobana. And um, Gastaldi is actually an uh, Italian cartographer. He is uh, one of the uh, leading cartographers of his um, time because in 16th century, Venice was actually a very important trading center for the uh, spices and they were also making a lot of maps and Gastaldi was uh, considered a very important map maker. Okay? And in his map, including in his world map, this is actually the, uh, not his world map, this is a map of uh, Southeast Asia. In his world map and in, in this map, he actually identifies Singapore as a cape. Do you see? C D Simkapula. This is actually, uh, do you see Malacca here? So this is the Malay Peninsula, which has been cut into half because the Europeans thought that the Moa River will uh, cut the Malay, the bottom of the Malay Peninsula into half. It's also another erroneous uh, perception because even though the um, sailors were coming here, they were traveling, they were sending back information. The cartographers who were based in Europe did not realize or did not even know much about the new discoveries. So most of the time they actually uh, listen to some, like, some tales and then they will say, oh, the Moa River is cutting. So in some of the maps you will find that Malay Peninsula is cut into half this way. Othelius. Othelius drew this um, map of uh, Singapore again um, in 16th um, century and his map names Singapore almost, almost similar to, to what you know Singap uh, Singapore as, but as Singapura. It's here. Do you see this? But do you see there's a kingdom there? It's as if Singapore is a, a small town along the Johor area. And Munster. Munster is another important uh, cartographer. He's uh, a German. He actually drew this map of uh, Sumatra. But uh, you can see a very interesting lion, lion down there, probably Thailand. And um, he calls Singapore Chinkatola. We are not sure whether he heard it at Singapore as Chingapore, but this is what he calls Singapore. Do you see Chinkatola? It's down here. Again, it's depicted as a, a town. Linshoten. Okay, Linshoten's map is oriented with north to your, is it? Yes, to your left there. Do you see this is China? This is China here. This is the Malay Peninsula. And do you see this interesting feature here that looks like a shrimp? That's actually Japan. Yeah, uh, this is a very beautiful map because it draws um, Japan as shrimp and Korea is a, a block. I'm losing my cursor. Korea is a block here, do you see? Yes, it's a block, kind of a block here. Okay, why Singapore is down here is very, very small. Okay, before I move on to the blown up version, I just want to mention something about um, Lin Shoten. Now, um, one of the, uh, the first 
European powers to come to uh, this part of the world were actually the Portuguese and the Spanish. Both were known as the Iberian powers. Okay, they, shared, they shared the same king, and so they were one of the earliest to come here. But what they did was they kept their maps or rather their charts very secret because they didn't want to share it with the rest of the European powers. Okay? So what happened? Lin Shoten was a, a Dutch uh, merchant. He was also a historian and a traveller. He went to work for the Archbishop of Goa, who was a Portuguese. And Goa was, a, was an important Portuguese trading centre at that time. So when he went to work for uh, this Archbishop of Goa, he managed to copy all the secret archives. I think the Archbishop liked him. So he copied all the secret uh, archives of the Portuguese. He copied all the sailing routes, the trading routes, how to travel from Malacca to Singapore, from Singapore on to all the Molaccas Islands, and what were the different goods that were being traded. And he also talked to people, who, the traders who were in Goa itself, and found out all this uh, interesting information. And what did he do? In 1596, he wrote what you call the itinerario, the sailing directions. Now, this opened up the world of Southeast Asia to the other European powers, the Dutch, the British, and the French. So by the end of 16th century, you find the Dutch managed to find a route to Southeast Asia and to the Spice Islands, and they broke the Portuguese monopoly of the trade. Okay. So, so this is an, a very interesting guy, and he's, uh, he drew a very interesting um, maps, although he did it stealthily. And it seems when the Dutch and the British trading ships were coming, they actually had a copy of the itinerary with them. Okay, it's a very uh, blur map, but I have it there in the display, so you can look at it. Do you see Sinkapura here? Yeah, and you can see that the island is, Malay Peninsula is cut and with the rivers flowing through. So this is one of the maps, yeah. Okay. Okay, moving on. Um, I'm, I'm showing you um, this because um, even though you've seen Singapore being, uh, the name of Singapore being uh, mentioned in, in various ways, and the placing of Singapore in various locations. Okay, so mostly you saw it as a town, but here you can see it's at a, Singapura. Dudley is a British uh, cartographer. This is actually a chart. It's a cape, but it's a Johor and Singapura are depicted as two separate promontories with a river running between them. Do you see here? This is in the 17th century. And you have Thief Nord, who is a French uh, cartographer, and this is his chart. And um, before I move on to show you uh, the blown up version, uh, do you see this? This is actually the China Wall. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so he he depicts Singapore as a uh, street, Strato di Singapura. Pedra Branca is there. Point Romania is there. Point Romania was also uh, is on the is on the southern tip of of um, Johor, and it's also a, tr um, a navigational landmark. So it's mentioned Strato di Singapura. Okay, so from here you will know that um, in early uh, European maps, you will find that Singapore will be either mentioned as a waterway, as a town, as a cape, but never as an island. Okay, so basically um, the question arises, was Singapore named because of the island, or was Singapore named because of the waterway? I mean, when did the name come about? Was, it, was the name Singapore attached to the waterways or to the island? So that's an interesting question. Okay, moving on. Okay, this was actually in the um, 17th century, and Valentin is a, a French uh, cartographer. His maps are very beautiful. If you look at his Java and Sumatra maps, they are very beautiful. This is already 18th century. By this time, you know, European discoveries should have made uh, some advance, advancements. But you have Singapore, almost similar to Singapore, but it's a town. It's actually a town together with other towns in our kingdom, and Johor is here. Okay. All right. So 
You've seen uh, maps, early maps, showing Singapore in its various uh, names, besides Singapore. And um, you also have seen Singapore being placed in various locations, but mostly at the end of Malay Peninsula. So that much we know that the Europeans were sure that it was somewhere at the end of the um, Malay um, Peninsula. But when was Singapore drawn as an um, island? It's actually known that um, Singapore was actually no drawn as an island on manuscript maps as early as 1500s. Okay, so even though you have European cartographers, even in 1700s, creating maps of Singapore as a town or a kingdom on Johor, you also have um, manuscript maps being created by the Europeans in the 1500s. Unfortunately, we don't have that. So they're all in overseas institutions. Um, what I can show you now is two maps from the collection in the uh, 18th century, which shows um, Singapore as an island, but it doesn't name it as Singapore. Okay. It calls it, uh, like Bellin is a French cartographer, he calls it Pulau Ao Isle Panjang. Okay. Pulau Panjang was a name that was traditionally also used by the locals for, for Singapore. It was also used for Sentosa. So some maps will show Sentosa as Pulau Panjang, which means Long Island. Yeah. And you have, do you see this? Now Salat Buru is, a, I think it's a corrupt version of Salat. Buru, which it refers to the Johor Straits. And then you can see one of the islands here is named Jur, probably a uh, corruption of uh, Johor. This map uh, also shows the different waterway channels that could be used by the European traders at the time, Pulau Al Panjang. It's not a discernible shape of Singapore, but it's almost there. This is um, Manvalet, another French uh, cartographer. And um, you can see that again, uh, oh, so again, sorry, the map is oriented with north to the, to the right. Okay? Yes. Singapore is somewhere here. And he calls Singapore Aya di Jatana Audi Singapore. Now, Jatana is probably a corruption of the word Ujung Tana, you know, beyond Tana. Okay, I'm, I'm getting a signal that my time is up. Okay, so that should be it. But before I end, I would like to let you know that um, uh, the Rare Maps collection, not all, okay, some of them have been digitized and we have placed them on uh, Book SG so you can actually assess the maps and you can actually see a, a blown up version. We are also uh, digitizing maps of the region, including Singapore, like some of the manuscript maps I told you about uh, from British Library and other overseas institutions, because uh, these are very rare maps, especially the manuscript maps, and it's difficult to acquire them. So what we are doing is we are acquiring the digital copies, and we will be putting them up on Book SG as well. The most recent one will be the British Library maps that will be coming up. Okay. One question I have after listening to your talk would be, why is Tamasic used for the locals while Singapore is generally more used by the Europeans and the non-locals? So your question is, why was Tamasic used by the locals but not by the uh, Europeans? Okay, that's uh, interesting. Tamasic is um, the local word which means sea town or seaport. Um, that was given by the uh, locals. Why wasn't it not used by the Europeans? It's possibly they either they didn't give importance or significance to it. Okay, it's it's possible, and also because of the name Singapura, or Singapore, or Singapore, as you saw in the early written text, especially in the um, Arabic text the Ibn Majid's uh, text you saw, Haviyat, is actually a poem, but he mentions a Singapore or Singapore, you know. So even they don't mention uh, Tamasik. So one of the reasons could be the Europeans uh, did not really come up with the idea themselves. They must have looked at texts before them. And they did depend heavily on Arabic navigators' sailing directions 
even before they came to this part of the world because the Arabs were already trade, trading with the Southeast Asians and Chinese even before the Europeans came. That's the only answer I can give. Unless as a reference librarian, I go and do more research and let you know. If you allow me to uh, reflect on the question about Tamase and Singapore, and uh, perhaps the answer lies in the chronology. By 1299, uh, the place was called Singapore. And the earliest European intervention in this part of the world was 300 years later, 1511 by the Portuguese. Yeah? So within that 300 years, uh, the European totally has forgotten about Tamase. The only uh, Tamase mentioned was by uh, uh, Wang Taiwan, right? And that was in the 1300, 1330, I think. So beyond 1330, Tamase has not been uh, mentioned in any text or manuscript or maps. Okay? So the European, when they came and uh, stopped at Singapore between the monsoon, the local says this is Singapore. Okay? They never say this is Tamase. Because in the Malay memory, uh, between 1299, they more or less have lapses about Tamase. So from then on, I think the, the, the ruler insists that everybody call the place as Singapore. So with the European coming for trading and stop in between the monsoons in Singapore, the place is named as uh, Singapore. I think that's, that's what I gather from my study of history. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could explain your use of the word corruption, because you've used it a lot to try and explain why um, certain names have changed or they're not very familiar. I understand that language would change from the past to now. But is there a reason? Is it corruption intentional or is it kind of just like word of mouth got around and then people didn't really know the spelling or it wasn't decided? Maybe you could explain that further. Okay, maybe um, I didn't mean the word corruption as in corruption, a strong term. When I meant corruption, it's what you mean by when they listen to something, you know, and they find out, okay, when you say ujung tana, and these are Europeans hearing the term ujung tana as... Um, Mr. Ashif, oh, Mr. Ashif mentioned, you know, um, there was a lapse in the memory as well at certain periods, you know, when they didn't say Tomasik, right? So when, but people did hear, when the Europeans came, they did hear something about Ujung Tana, Pulo, Panjang. So all these that they heard were incorporated into the knowledge of those who were all making maps at Europe itself. So when I use the word corruption, I mean it in the sense like what they heard is different from what was told to the person who directed the information. So you have this passing down of information. So that's why you see you don't see, you see words like Viontana. I can't say it's a transliteration, like when the Chinese Wang Daiyuan came and he called Panchur Banju, I can say it's a transliteration because that's a Chinese way of saying Panchur. You know? But when the um, Europeans came and they said Viontana, which is actually meant for Ujung Tana, or jatana, you know it's uh, meant to be like a, a, a corruption of the real term. Mm -hmm.